Coming up, sick and tired with cold and flu season here, we'll take a look at our body's own special army on hand to fight off those viruses. Plus, possum teachers, we visit a classroom where puppies are helping students in some unique ways. Kids that were like, you know, hesitant to pick up a book and read, they couldn't wait to read to a puppy. Then, rescue mission, an otter finds a new home at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. Pop quiz this week will put your U.S. state knowledge to the test. And Drone Club, we head to Texas to see what all the buzz is about at a local school. Before like the drone competition, like I had like a short amount of friends, but like now uh, it's like we're all friends, like all of us. All that and more coming up on this edition of Nightly News Kids Edition. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It is great to be with you. We have a jam-packed show today. We'll visit a school in Delaware where students and puppies are sharing a classroom. How about that? They are learning some valuable lessons about productivity and mental health. We'll share that story. You'll also meet a sea otter who has made an amazing journey to his new home. We test your knowledge about U.S. states in our pop quiz. And we'll hit the pickleball courts in New Jersey to find out why this sport is so popular. But first, here's our friend Dr. John Torres to give us some tips on how to get through cold and flu season. Sometimes, even when we do everything right, viruses sneak into our body and they can make us sick, regardless of what type of illness, COVID, the common cold, the flu, a sore throat, or even a stomach bug, we do have a few tools to fight them off. The first, sleep. When you're sick, your immune system is working really hard to fight off the virus. This will make you more tired than usual. You want to get as much rest and sleep as possible because sleep slows down other functions your body does while awake, like thinking, talking, and even blinking. This saves energy so your immune system can keep fighting. To help you feel better, your parents may give you some medications that they got at the store or from your doctor. These can relieve symptoms like coughing, fever, or a sore throat. The most important thing when you're sick, stay hydrated. It's very important that you drink a lot of fluids. That can include water, fruit juices, or sports drinks. Why? Well, all the cells in your body need water in order to work properly. And when you're sick, it's especially important because water helps the immune system create more antibodies. And remember, antibodies, those soldiers, are what fight off viruses. Now, what about food? Well, you may have heard the phrase, feed a cold, starve a fever. But kids, this is a myth. Yes, a myth. Regardless of whether you have a cold, the flu, or something else, you want to try to eat because food gives your body energy to fight the virus. Fruits, vegetables, and peanut butter are some good options. But sometimes getting sick causes you to lose your appetite. And if that happens, try eating plain foods like crackers or toast. And there's nothing better than a comforting bowl of chicken noodle soup when you're sick. And it really does help you get better. It thins the mucus in your nose and throat to make you less congested, and it helps hydrate you. And when you combine all these tools together, sleep, fluids, food, and medication, it can help you get better faster. All right, thanks, Dr. John. Switching gears, did you know that winter is one of the best times to look into the night sky and see a meteor shower? Here to explain the celestial phenomenon is our friend Aaron McLaughlin. Throughout the northern hemisphere, stunning displays of shooting stars lit up the sky last week. It's called the Quadrantids Meteor Shower, peaking every year during the first few days of January and expected to last until the middle of the month. The Quadrantids Meteor Shower is considered one of the best celestial shows of the year. It's a great kept secret, actually, and we can see as many as well, depending on where you are, up to 60 to 100 shooting stars per hour. Scientists say the quadrantids can produce some of the most visible and spectacular fireballs of all meteor showers. Now, sometimes there are really bright meteors, these streaks that we see that are unusually bright, and they can even cause shadows. They can be brighter than the moon, so we call them fireballs. Well, what those are are baseball to basketball-sized stones, or maybe even as big as, as a living room sofa. 
those sized rocks can really create a very eye-catching kind of fireball that streaks across the sky. This comes as stargazers were just treated last month to the Geminids meteor shower, named because the meteors appear to radiate from the constellation Gemini. Did you know a meteor is a streak of light in the sky and is actually a space rock crashing through the Earth's atmosphere? It happens when those rocks, really a small piece of an asteroid or comet called meteoroid, burns up upon entering the Earth's atmosphere. If a meteoroid comes close enough to Earth and enters our atmosphere, it vaporizes and turns into a meteor, a streak of light in the night sky. What's more, some meteor showers happen every year like clockwork, so there's plenty more magic in store for 2024. If you've missed the quadrants, no problem, because you've got in April 22nd, the Lyrid meteor shower, and then on August 12th and 13th, uh, don't forget, you've got the Perseid meteor shower. And then finally, at the end of the year, the Geminids on December 13th is also an amazing celestial fireworks show you don't want to miss. So there are multiple chances, so many shooting stars to make wishes. So get your wishes ready and don't forget to look up. Okay, Aaron, thanks. Hey, it's time to head to an elementary school in Delaware now, where some furry friends are patiently waiting for students. Here to explain why is our friend Peter Alexander. How are you doing? <laughs> That's what it started morning on. So it's not exactly your normal school greeting, but at Hanby Elementary in Wilmington, Delaware, it's just the way Brooke Hughes' first graders like it. Hughes has always been an animal lover, and after fostering several puppies during the pandemic, a light bulb went off. What did the school say when you said, so I have an idea, right. I want to bring puppies to the classroom? Right, there was a lot of questions, um, but they said, after I kept telling all the research about how dogs and puppies, you know, can increase, you know, productivity and mental health, they said, all right, you get one day. That one day turned into the rest of the school year and the beginning of Foster Tales Puppy Therapy, a program Hughes created that she says has changed how her students learn. We've seen a benefit in their reading scores because if they have puppy time, if the puppies are asleep, they have to read to them. And so their reading confidence has soared. And the kids that were like, you know, hesitant to pick up a book and read, they couldn't wait to read to a puppy. These days, these first graders' classmates include a pair of eight-week-old husky pit bull mixes, Kelsey and Graham, fittingly a tribute to their favorite Philadelphia Eagles players not far away. Hughes brings Kelsey and Graham home every night, but during the days, they've taught these kids to do more than just cuddle and play. The empathy with each other and the patience with each other, I've seen that being a huge growth since before we had puppies. Every morning they have to do a little check-in. How are you feeling today? This year, almost every day, they circle excited and I say, how are you feeling today? Like, I'm excited because I get to come to school with puppies and you. As a teacher, you can't ask for a lot more. I can't that. ask for it. I mean, if you, I think my number one job as a teacher in this grade is to make school fun, make learning fun, the rest will come. And it's coming quick. Just look at the poster Sydney made. Will you read it for me? Okay. okay. Adopt a dog because they are playful and they like treats and they like naps. They do like naps. 20 puppies have now come through Hughes' classroom before finding their forever homes. Lincoln, why do we want these puppies to be adopted? So they can have a home. We want them to find a home forever, right? And this video she posted of her kids and the puppies bonding went viral with nearly 3 million views. People lost their TikTok minds. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea it was going to blow up. Why do you think it resonated? I think seeing the joy that the kids had and they fell in love with kids reading to them, of course. That puppy love has helped all of her students, including Logan, who is mostly nonverbal and uses this device to communicate. I like to read to Kelsey and Grant. He just came out of his shell. He came out of his shell, but he also taught us that he knows more than we knew. He was reading an above grade level book to the puppies. Wow. Good job. Good <laughs> job. Woof. It's not just the kids that benefit, but the puppies too. If they weren't here, they would be in a cage most of the day at the shelter. 
And here they're being socialized. They're learning all kinds of different sights and sounds and smells. Socialization for the puppies. Oh yeah. Learning for the kids. Yep. I mean, who wouldn't want to learn like this? It's hard not to love adorable puppies, right? Are you being adorable? Are you yeah, being adorable, of. Graham? Oh, whoa, Bumble, <laughs> are you trying to, whoa, that was a French one. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. That seemed like a rough assignment. It's time for a pop quiz now, and this time we are putting your U.S. state knowledge to the test. Which U.S. state has the longest cave system in the world? Is it Texas, Kentucky, or New York? Let me give you a moment to think about it. Okay, time's up. The answer is Kentucky. Mammoth Cave National Park is the longest known cave system in the world. More than 400 miles have already been explored, and scientists think there are still miles to go. I wonder what they'll find. Well, coming up, rescue mission. We meet an otter pup who has had quite the journey. So this little guy, he was found out in Alaska, out by Seldovia, and he was seen by some people kind of swimming around by himself. Hitting the court, we explore the pickleball craze sweeping the nation. I think more kids are starting to play because it's a very easy sport that you can just play, like play after school with like a friend. I like making crazy shots. I like the sound when it hits the paddle in the middle. And drone club. We visit an elementary school in Texas whose drone club has gone pro and taken home awards at several competitions. Last competition, we won a trophy, and we were the youngest people there. We were literally the only elementary school. It doesn't matter how old you are, because no matter how old you are, you can always accomplish good stuff. Welcome back, guys. There's a new pup in town at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and our friend Laura Jarrett has the remarkable tale of this sea otter pup who was found all alone in Alaska and has now found a new home. At the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, there's a new pup in town. This sea otter pup was just eight weeks old when he was found all alone in Alaska. So this little guy, he was found out in Alaska, out by Seldovia, and he was seen by some people kind of swimming around by himself, where pups would not normally have to be with their mothers for about six months. Fish and Wildlife Services called Alaska Sea Life Center and the Shedd Aquarium for help. Under their care, this little pup is doing swimmingly. He is doing very well. He's thriving, working on gaining weight all the time. Did you know a group of sea otters is called a raft? Male sea otters hang out in different rafts among female otters who raise their pups, together in a group, often without help from the dads. Pups start out drinking milk from their moms, but once they get older, the world is their oyster when it comes to mealtime. They eat all sorts of things from the kelp forest, so they love to eat mussels and clam and crab, sea cucumbers, octopus, whatever they could find. They are especially keen on eating sea urchins, which is also really important. That's right, sea otters love to eat spiky sea urchins, which is great for the kelp forest ecosystem. That's because sea urchins eat a lot of kelp, which provides homes to thousands of animals in kelp forests. And when it comes to saving snacks, sea otters have a built-in storage system, somewhere you might not expect. They have kind of like a built-in shopping bag in their armpits. They have a little extra flap of skin that could help them store food. So when they dive down, they could put as much food as they can into that pocket and then bring it up and then eat it at the surface. So it's pretty cool to see them kind of put as much stuff in there as possible. These social creatures are vital parts of their ecosystems. Unfortunately, their populations are shrinking due to human actions like pollution and oil spills. However, there are things that you can do to protect this endangered species. Sea otters and humans like a lot of the same kinds of seafood, so making sure that we're choosing sustainably caught, which means we're not taking that food away from the sea otters in their environment is really important. And then being careful of pollution and oil use as well. And if you happen to be near a shore and spot a sea otter, keep your distance and be sure to tell a parent or grown-up 
so they can make a call to Fish and Wildlife Services or local animal control. That way, sea otters in need of help, just like this little pup at the Shedd Aquarium, can continue to dive on. I love that story. Laura, thank you. Well, switching gears now, what game is a mix of tennis, ping pong, and badminton all rolled into one? If you guess pickleball, you're right. And here to explain the pickleball craze is our friend Dylan Dreyer. These kids have their game faces on. One at a time. What I love most is that it's very like fast paced. There's a lot of running involved. I love beating adults. We're talking pickleball, and now more and more kids are paddling up and playing this sport as well. I think more kids are starting to play because it's a very easy sport that you can just play, like play after school with like a friend. I like making crazy shots. I like the sound when it hits the paddle in the middle. I play a few times a week, sometimes just for fun, and sometimes in like a league. It's just like a fun sport that you get to like talk to people. My favorite thing about pickleball and why I like playing it is because it's a good escape from school. I like pickleball because I think it's fun and it's just a cool game and it's pretty simple. At Downtown Sports in Mawa, New Jersey, dozens of young players are showing up every week to play, practice, and learn. The youngest is just four years old. I think they're surprised at how fun they think it is and, you know, how, how much they really like it. They love playing with anybody that will be out there on the court playing with them and they're having fun. And they can say, hey, I can play, I can do this, and it definitely builds their confidence. I like pickleball because I used to play tennis and ping pong, and I feel like this is a balanced mix of both. A cross between tennis and ping pong. The court, though, is so much smaller than a tennis court. Coach Tina Marshy says pickleball is easy to learn and teaches valuable skills like great eye coordination, getting to the line, playing together as a team. They're learning friendships. They're socializing. 14-year-old twin sisters Emily and Catherine Cho have been playing pickleball for a little over a year. When I first started, I couldn't stop I just like the energy that comes off of pickleball. Just try it because it's like not that hard to try. It's a very easy sport to catch on to. At just 15, Harrison Malco is not only a player, but a certified instructor as well. Harrison picked up pickleball two years ago and says one of the things he likes most about the sport is that anybody can play it. I love that in basketball, you can kind of win over people. And I'm using basketball as, as an example. You can win over uh, games just by your athleticism, your reach, your height, stuff like that. In pickleball, that's not the case whatsoever. Of course, it helps to be athletic, but in this game, it really comes down to shot selection, core positioning, just general decision making. It gravitates more towards the idea that anybody can play this game. For nine-year-old Miles Greenberg, his favorite part. I like sliding and diving because it just helps me like get the ball faster. Pickleball is also a family affair. My kids play other sports, but this is the only sport that we play as a family. I don't know of another sport really where it's so easy for parents to actually play together with the kids as opposed to just watching them play. Usually my mom has a packed schedule, so it's just fun that we get to play sometimes and like bond over it. Playing together and bonding and so much more. I'd say that since I'm a pretty shy person, it really opened me up to speaking to new people, and everyone here is so nice. I learned how to like be more patient because like I have to be so patient like during like thinking and stuff. Pickleball is like really fun, and if, when you get the hang of it, like you don't want to stop playing. Pickleball proving to be a winner for all ages. All right, thanks, Dylan. Now to a piece of technology you may have heard of before or even played with yourself. We're talking about drones. Our sponsor, Walton Family Foundation, introduced us to an elementary school in Texas whose drone club has gone pro and taken home awards at several competitions. Let's see what all the buzz is about. At Harmony School of Innovation in Euless, Texas, things are looking up. Three, two, one, go. 
A group of fourth and fifth graders have formed a club that's all about drones. It's like a fun and educational drone competition where uh, there's different obstacles like the keyholes and um, blackout. The Flying Tigers are practicing for two upcoming aerial drone competitions where they'll go up against middle and high schoolers. Last year, the Flying Tigers came in first at regionals. Last competition, we won a trophy, and we were the youngest people there. We were literally the only elementary school. It doesn't matter how old you are, because no matter how old you are, you can always accomplish good stuff. So how does it work? First, students choose whether they want to be a pilot or a coder. Pilots control their drones with a remote control, one that looks similar to a video game controller. It's very similar to like a system, game system. Personally, like if you have experience with like remote control games, you're gonna be very good at this. Each pair of pilots relies on two observers to direct the drone from the other side of the course, especially in one particular zone called the blackout, where pilots can't see anything at all. It's actually an important job because you, you, you can't see the hoop that's behind it. So I have to show them how to move. Like I could you either use my voice or I could just show them with my hands like that. And then have a, I and say have a go left. On the other side, coders write lines of code into a computer which they program into the drone to tell it where to go. So you take this USB cord and you connect it to this computer, which, and if you're on the website, It'll take all the code and transfer it through into this controller and then the drone the antenna sends that code to the drone. Yes! Coders face a unique challenge, directing a drone through obstacles before it's even taken flight. Like something isn't working you can, and then you think, like, it's a small mistake, you can fix it easily and then when you do it, you're, you're like, wow, I did it. Yay! Both pilots and coders must guide their drones through a complex obstacle course, earning points for tasks like gathering plastic balls, soaring through hoops, yes. and of course, successful landings. Every single time we finish, like once they land, we're so happy, like we're so free, like we're so grateful. It feels exhilarating, feels like you really accomplish something. These kids are passionate competitors, spending time after school and even Saturdays practicing for upcoming competitions. Led by their computer teacher, Kareem Bailiev, the Flying Tigers are picking up lessons that will last a lifetime. Great job, Omar, come back now. Great, great. What's more, they're making friends along the way. I love when we accomplish something good and we all get excited and our team gets all happy. I met a lot of new people that are my friends now. Oh, they made the second loop, yeah. Before like the drone competition, like I had like a short amount of friends, but like now, uh, it's like we're all friends, like all of us. Wise beyond their years and flying high above the competition. So how cool was that, right? Well, that's going to do it for us, everybody. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram, at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.